Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. In Luke 21, if you'll turn to Luke chapter 21, how many of you love God's word? Okay, we got one amen. How many of you love God's word? Amen. Amen. I love God's word. You know why? God's word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. When you open this thing, you just turn the light on. You actually, when you get in the word, it will light your way. It will show you which way you ought to go in. It will show you the things that are coming, the things that have already taken place, that are to take place, yet to come things. And um, we're going to look in Luke chapter 21 today. And Jesus is inside of the temple. And he's making and he's speaking about certain observations. And the first thing he talks about in verses 1 through 4 is he talks first about giving into the treasury. So we can know in those days, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus went to the church, as we call it, he went to the temple, we call it the temple, that the people gave financially. Because it says, and he looked and he saw the rich man, rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. So that we know there was poor men and women and there was rich men and women all in the church together. Amen? And they were all putting in money into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow has cast in more than they all, or more than all the others. Now the poor widow didn't even put in but two mites. But Jesus made an observation in the temple and he wrote about it. He said, this woman has put in more than all of you. And this is why. Because it says, she has cast in more than they all. For all these have out of their abundance cast into the offerings of God. But she has of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. In other words, this woman cast in every single penny she had to her name. She cast in everything. And Jesus made an observation in the temple that even though the rich men had maybe they had given tens of thousands of dollars that day. Maybe some of them had put in a thousand dollars. Maybe some of them had put in two thousand dollars or ten thousand. Jesus made a notable observation so much so that he has it written in his words in red and he said I tell you what that woman that gave Everything she had to live on has given more in my sight than all those that gave out of what they had in abundance. See, the rich people were given out of their excess. She was given out of her necessity. There's times you make sacrificial offerings to the Lord, and uh, he takes note of them. i tell you what, he takes note of them. Today you may be given to the Lord out of an offering to the Lord. You may be coming in to give a tithe or an offering, and it may be a sacrifice to you. I want you to t- know this. God sees everything you give for his work. He sees every ounce of labor. He sees every penny you've ever given. And let me tell you what, he's got a good accounting system in heaven. And he is going to reward you. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's going to reward you. According as we've done, he's going to reward us. He will not let that go unrewarded. God won't let what you've done for him go unrewarded. He said, if you even give a glass of water in my name, you'll not lose your reward. I tell you what, we're we're approaching a reward day. You know, some of you are saying, you know, I got blessed this week. I used to clean one part of this building. Now I get to clean both. That's a reward from the Lord. That's a blessing from the Lord right there because you've been faithful. Come on. That's God blessing you right there. He's rewarding you. He gives you favor. He's causing his face to shine on you. Amen. We got blessed this week it's God we give God the glory for it when it's time that God wants us to do something we do what he wants us to do but when it comes time to reward day when we need God to bless something for us guess what he's faithful all we need be is faithful too because he is faithful amen 
Even if we're faithless, it doesn't change him. He's still faithful, amen? It doesn't change him, just to, even if we're not. And it says, as um, uh, then he talks about the beauty of the temple. Notice the first thing he talks about is the money giving in the temple. The second thing he talks about has to do with the beauty of the temple. It says, and as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. This is what Jesus had to say about it. As for these things which you behold, which you see, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. You want to brag about your building and your sanctuary and, oh, look how beautiful a building we've erected? Jesus said, let me speak prophetic, prophetically to you. Do you notice how in contrast he speaks to the men of God? Men think it's something when they put their money in the treasury, the rich, and Jesus just tears it down and says, the widow give more than you. <laughs> Come on. Then he says, oh, look at this building. Look at all these goodly stones. Look how beautiful. And Jesus says, ah, look at it well, because soon it's going to be completely thrown down. This building won't even be standing soon. Wow. Watch it, his observations. And see, some people take and put so much effort into their churches and their buildings that building we're in today, it's nothing. The Bible says that God doesn't dwell in buildings built by human hands. God dwells in human temples. The reason God's in this place is because you and I are in this place and God's in us. Come on, we can meet in a little old shack and have church. Amen? Some people think they got to go to a church that looks big and, and uh, beautiful. Some people actually choose their church by looking at the outward appearance. God's got a word for you. <laughs> I'll let him give it. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Amen. Verse 7, and it says, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall all these things be? Now the disciples want to know, when are these things going to happen, and what will be the sign of these things to come to pass? And in verses 8, we see through 11, we're going to read 8 through 11. He said, take heed that you don't be deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. Then he said, after this, nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom shall rise against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers, which means worldly places. And famines shall be, and pestilences shall be. And fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these. Now, I underline this. Before all of these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and into prison, being brought before kings and rulers. Why? For my name's sake. Now, in verse 12, Jesus speaks prophetically about his own disciples' fate regarding the things which they will each personally go through and experience as a direct result of association with himself with the Christ he says I'm going to speak to you prophetically I'm going to speak to you about your future this morning I want you to know I'm going to speak to you about your future this morning I'm going to speak to you prophetically to you who are disciples of Jesus so put on your ears this morning because what he said there that applied to his disciples then still applies to his disciples of today. And we who are alive and well today, who are Jesus' true followers, we need to understand that the same things that happened to his disciples, that it is capable of happening to us. It may not mean that we go to prison, or it may mean we go to prison. It may not mean we get killed for our faith, but brothers and sisters, there are some in the world that died yesterday for the cause of Christ. That they did nothing wrong except serve the Lord with their whole heart and love him and honor him 
and obey him. And they're dead this morning. There are people, brothers and sisters of yours and mine, that are dropping dead right now. They're having their heads cut off. They're hanging them. They're cutting their fingers off. They're cutting their toes off. You don't want to hear that, do you? We don't want to hear that when we even come to church. Oh, that makes me oh, cringe. But we need to look at what Jesus said prophetically. He said, before all these things come to pass, people's going to lay their hands on you. And some of you, they're going to put in prison. And it's going to be all for one reason that this is happening to you. For my name's sake. They're going to do it because you bear witness with my name. You call yourself after me. You call yourself a Christian. You're my follower. You do whatever I tell you to do. And for that reason, people are going to hate on you. And people are going to persecute you. And people are going to come against you. Now he talks about here in verse 12. He says they're going to be... They're going to persecute you and deliver you up in the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So I want you to take note of this. The people he's talking about here persecuting them are not family and friends and kin folks. Come on. It's people they probably don't know very well. It's actually the government. The kings and the rulers are the government. In those days. The government is coming against the Christians. Do we see any of that today? Do we see it more this year than we've ever seen it before in our lifetime? That Christians are being persecuted. Unlike any other faith is being persecuted. Others can do it and nothing said. But let the Christians stand up for what we believe in. And we're called bigots. Racists. Haters. Dividers. <clears throat> he said in the next verse, and I want you to pay careful attention to what he gives them because once he gives them the truth, and it's a hard truth, imagine you're sitting there in the presence of Jesus and Jesus just told you what was going to happen to you because you're his follower. They're not feeling too excited right that moment because they know some of the stuff that come against him is fixing to come against them, right? Right? Now watch what he says. He gives them a word of hope to follow it up. And it shall turn. I'm going to stop there. And it shall turn. Everybody say, it shall turn. Come on, say, it shall turn. It shall turn to you for a testimony. Was what they're going through going to be wasted in vain? No, but what was God going to do? He was going to take it and he was going to... Turn it around and use it as an opportunity that he, they could testify of his great greatness before those kings and before those rulers and before those who persecuted them. He said, I'm going to turn it. I tell you this morning, God's going to turn it. Watch him turn it. Sometimes we may think God doesn't know what's going on. But God knows everything that's going on. He says, I'm going to turn it. I'm going to turn it for a testimony. Then in verse 14, he says, settle it, therefore, in your hearts. Go ahead and make it a settled thing in your heart. Just say this in your heart right now. Say, I'm not going to meditate beforehand how I'm going to answer when I'm brought before the kings and the rulers and they're about ready to throw me in prison. I'm not even going to think about beforehand what I'm going to say. I'm just going to let God say through me what he wants to say. He told them, go ahead and settle it in your heart. Don't premeditate what you're going to say when they lay their hands on you and they put you in prison. And then it's your time to go stand before the judge. He said, I don't want you to worry about what you're going to say when that judge calls your name up there. He said, when you get there, I'm going to give you what to say, and it won't even be you speaking. It'll be the Holy Ghost. And it's going to turn for a testimony that you were doing exactly what I told you to do, and they were opposing you. He said, watch me turn it now. But I, I, I would be like, but wait, God, couldn't we do this some different way? 
Why do we have to go through all this, right? Couldn't God do something better than having to let them go through all that? Wouldn't it be an easy way to testify to these kings and rulers than to have to get the disciples there, but they got to be arrested, and they got to go to prison, and then they got to be called, and then they got to testify of Jesus in front of these kings and rulers? Wouldn't there be some easier way that we could evangelize? You would think so. But Jesus is prophesying to his disciples here, y'all. See, we think it's foreign when we're persecuted for Christ's name's sake. We think that's foreign. It's never been foreign. It's been since the beginning of the church. And the church, the true church of today will be persecuted. You better just go ahead and, and put on your big girl panties. Put on your big boy undies because we're going to be persecuted. And it's increased over the past three or four years. Has it not increased over the three or four years? Well, what if it increases even more? I'm not trying to make you down and out. I'm just telling you, if you understand what's going on, you can go through it a whole lot easier than when you're sitting there, I don't know what's happening. The Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The Word of God lets us know what's going to happen to you if you're a true disciple of Jesus's. You are most probably going to be persecuted by the world, right? Okay, we got that fact. How many of you know it's easier to be persecuted by the world than it is people you love? <laughs> Come on, I mean, truthfully. If, if John Blow persecutes me and I don't know him, it don't really bother me that much, what other people says that don't even know you, right? Okay, let's go further. He said, when that come, time comes and you're brought before the kings and the rulers, he said, I will give you a mouth. I love that. Have you ever had somebody tell you that you got a mouth on you? You got a mouth on you. Maybe you said it to one of your children. You got a mouth on you. But do you know if we got a mouth on us, on us, it needs to be the mouth that Jesus gave us. We need to have a mouth that Jesus gives us. And with that mouth, we need to have wisdom. He said, I will give you a mouth and I will give you wisdom so that when you stand before your accusers, that what you say will be of me. He said, all of your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist you. Now he starts talking about, he calls them what they are, enemies. He said, these that are persecuting you, the rulers and kings you're going to be brought before, they're your enemies. They're not your friends. They're your foes. He calls them enemies. Now it gets deeper. Verse 16. Jesus is prophesying. And he says, You shall be betrayed by both, both by parents. Parents there means mother and father. Write that down. He says you're going to be betrayed by both parents, mother and father. He doesn't stop there. He says, and brethren, your brothers and sisters. Doesn't stop there. By your kinfolk. <laughs> That would be your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law, your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law, your second cousin, your nephew, your niece, your great aunt, your great uncle, your grandmama, your grandpappy. Come on, ever he said your kin folks. That could be any of your kin folks or all of them. He didn't stop there. He said, and your friends. Think of your friends. Think of your friends right now. He's telling them to think of their friends and think of their kinfolks and think of their parents and think of their brothers and sisters. He said, you shall be betrayed. I think of Jesus with Judas. 
Judas betrayed Jesus. He betrayed him, right? He was supposedly for him, but he never really was for him. He was a chosen disciple who could have repented, but he didn't. And he became Jesus' ultimate betrayer, and his end was not good. If you ever see a person betray someone and they don't repent, you'll see a bitter end come their way. Watch it. I mean, we've probably all betrayed somehow, some way, at some point, somebody. We've probably all let down a good friend or our parents or somebody that we've talked about or said something. I don't believe a one of us can stand in here and say, oh, I'm perfect. I've never done anything to hurt anybody else, even those that I love. I believe we've probably all said things and done things that we wish we could undo. Am I speaking the truth? How many of you have said things that you wished you could take back, but you can't? How many of you have ever done something that you wished you could take back, but you can't? But he said, this is a little bit different. This is a little bit different. This is because you have been doing what I've taught you to do. And they're going to come against you because you are doing what I've told you to do. And your enemies are going to rise up against you. And they're going to oppose you. And it's going to be those of your own household. He gets down to the place, I could pull out all the scriptures, I don't have time. But he said, even those of your own household shall betray you. Now, I believe he was saying a possibility. I don't believe he meant in every family. Because I believe in a family, if the husband, if the wife, if the children are all in Christ, there's not going to be any betraying. I mean, of course, we're going to make mistakes and fall short. I'm talking about where somebody turns against you and hates on you and departs from you all because you choose to serve the Lord. And you know what the Bible says about that? It says, if an unbeliever departs from you, let him go. It says, if an unbeliever departs from you, let her go. For God has called you unto peace. God don't want you living in turmoil. If a person is content to live with you, that is an unbeliever, but they're content to live with you, then don't divorce them. Let him who is married not seek to be divorced. Let him who is single not seek to be married. That's what the Bible says. And if the unbeliever is willing to live with you in peace, then remain with them. Don't go get a divorce. Who knows if you might sanctify that whole household? Who knows if your conversation and the way you live and conduct your life might convert that such a one unto the Lord? Stay with them. But if the unbeliever departs from you, don't chase them down. Let them go. Y'all, I'm preaching the word this morning. I'm preaching the word. It far exceeds our own natural wisdom. The wisdom of God comes from heaven above. So when we're preaching the word of God, this is from heaven. This is the wisdom of God, and it comes from heaven. Do you notice he says you're going to be betrayed by not just the world, but he said you're going to be betrayed by people you love. Have you ever had somebody that you really, really loved? But they betrayed you for Christ's name's sake because you were a Christian. Maybe you haven't. Maybe we haven't. But Jesus was saying that to his true disciples, that that would happen to them. So we shouldn't be surprised if it ever happens like that. We should look at the Bible and say, well, Jesus told us that that could happen. I mean, you know, if it hasn't happened, it just hasn't happened. And praise God, it hasn't. My prayer would be that we're all on the same page and we're all serving the Lord and following Him. Amen? That we're not opposing one another in the faith, but we're walking in unity together as we serve the Lord. Right? I would pray for my parents and my husband and me and my kinfolk and my friends for all of us to be walking in the way.
not in the way, but in the way of the Lord. But sometimes it's not that case. And I have heard of many family members that have come against people and disowned them, put them out, put them out, and said, you cannot live here any longer in my house and talk about Jesus and cast them out. So Jesus is prophesying, and he says, you shall be hated of all, all men, for my name's sake. He said, all men are going to hate on you, not for anything you've done wrong. Because when people start hating you, what's the first thing you say? What did I do? Isn't that what we say? When people start treating us hateful, and people stop speaking to us, and people quit calling us, and people quit having anything to do with us, the first thing we say is, what did I do? But Jesus is explaining in prophecy, the reason they're hating you is because you bear my name, because you are my true follower. And that would have to be the conditions. It wouldn't be because they're hating on you because something you did personally. This would have to be the conditions met. But he said, but there's, watch this when he turns it. Every time Jesus says something, like you're way thrown in prison, but he's going to turn it for a testimony. Now he says, you're going to be hated by your friends and you can, folks. But watch this. He said, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. You notice every time he comes back with the last word, how many of you know Jesus is going to get the last word? He's going to have the last word when it comes to you and me and all who serve him. He's going to have the last word. So it's going to be good. I just want you to know that if you're out there serving the Lord every day and things are falling apart in your life, don't worry about it because it's going to end good because Jesus is going to have the last word. While they were in prison, they might not have thought so. I think that's why Jesus had to prophesy the end. He said, but there won't be a hair of your head that perishes. Watch him use the word perish. In your patience, possess ye your soul. In your patience. He said, this is fixing to be a call for patient endurance, for tests and trials, for persecution, the same way I went. Is the servant greater than the master? How many of you serve the Lord in here? Are we, as his servants, greater than him? That if they persecuted him, that they won't persecute us? If they call Jesus the prince of the devil, will they not also call you the devil? Jesus has already written all of this for us. And we act like we just don't understand it. He said, in my day, they call me the devil, and I'm the son of God. I'm their savior. I'm the one that loves them. I'm the one that's here for them, but they're calling me the devil. Hmm. I said, thank you for the word, Lord. Some people just don't even realize that there are people who care about them that they're persecuting. The very people that love and care for them are the very ones they're hating on. Like when Jesus walked, the very one that loved them and came to save them and set them free was the very one they looked and said, he's of the devil. Hmm. And he said, it's going to happen to you. If you follow me, if you do what I tell you to do, it's going to happen to you. But in your patience, just be patient. Possess your souls. I looked at the list again. In fact, I wrote it down and tried to memorize it. You're going to be betrayed by parents, brethren, kinfolks, and friends. That's the list of the four he gave us. Parents, brethren, kinfolks, and friends. Maybe since you became a Christian. Maybe before you became a Christian, you had a good relationship with all your family. Everybody was in peace and harmony. 
You didn't have any alts or outs with any of your friends, any of your kinfolk, your parents, and you didn't have any alts or outs, and all your brothers and sisters you was good with. Who am I preaching to this morning? I'm telling you, Jesus gave me this word this morning for this church. But now that you've become a Christian and you've started serving the Lord, you've, you've got outs with this one and that one and this one's not getting along and that one's not getting along and this one's not speaking to that one anymore and that one's mad with that one. And you're like, what is going on? The question is this. Are you be, being persecuted and hated on for Christ's name's sake? If you are, let me encourage you. I'm going to give you the word of the Lord. Great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. You may not get your reward, but you're going to get it in heaven. I have seen people close their eyes in death with their persecutors never repenting and them never being restored to their family. I've seen it in my family. Close their eyes in death, never having restoration. But I believe if they made the right choice to stand for the Lord and not bow to those principalities and powers that when they opened, closed their eyes here and opened their eyes in heaven, they saw their reward and received it. And that's what matters, church. That's what matters. Don't ever bow to another God. Be strong. Be courageous. Go in. Possess the land. Take authority. Exercise authority that God has given you. Don't be cowardly. The Lord hasn't said we're to be cowardly. To be cowardly is to be unbelieving. You have to know who you are and to whom you belong to. You have to even know your own heart and what you seek to do for the kingdom of God. That your whole reason for being here is to serve God. And to prosper and further his kingdom and his agenda. But many today oppose that. Many today oppose the kingdom of God. They oppose God himself. And if you identify yourself with him and you work to further the kingdom, they're going to oppose you too is what he's saying. And it's not just going to be from people you don't know. It's going to be from people that you love and that are close to you. And that's painful, brethren. But your choice is this. Do we have a choice? I'm going to press on with God and Jesus. Or I'm going to do what the people want me to do. As for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. You may not be able to say that except about yourself. The Bible says that there comes a day where a son will be against a father. Where a mother will be against her daughter. Where a son-in-law will be against his father-in-law. Where the father-in-law will be against the son-in-law. And the Bible says that Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, rather division. Now, that's a mystery within itself to understand because Jesus wasn't necessarily a divider. He wasn't divisive in an evil way. But let me tell you what, we're getting close to the great divide. The great divide is when we stand at the throne and God is seated on the throne and at his right hand, Jesus is seated with the Father on the throne of glory. And all the nations are gathered before him, all the tribes, every man, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. 
and he separates the sheep and he puts them on his right hand. And he separates the goats and he puts them on his left hand. God has a right hand. And his right hand is truth. It's the hand with which he upholds us. It's with the hand that he supports us and helps us. He said, with my right hand will I uphold you. But God has a left hand. And he said, in my left hand, I will put the goats on my left hand. There's coming a day where God is going to separate. We're not to do that, but he will. He said he'll send his angels. And they'll take out of this world those who are ready. That's a separation, brothers. That's a separation, sisters. There's coming a day where the Lord's going to split the eastern sky, and he's coming back on the clouds of glory. And we who are ready are going to be caught up together with him. We're not going to be divided from him. We're going to go to be with him. But there's going to be a division because everybody who wasn't ready is going to be left here. They're going to be separated from the Father. When we talk about division, it's getting down to the great divide. We are approaching the great divide. I don't know about you, but all I know is this. There's nothing more that matters to me than being ready when my time comes and I see his face and I look into his eyes and he opens his mouth to speak to me. I want to hear him say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord prepared for you from the, before the foundation of the world. Enter in. Welcome home. But did you know that some people are not going to hear well done? Some people are going to hear. Depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. You who continue to work iniquity in spite of all you knew. I believe we're going to see more and more of the divide. I'm praying God will bring us to our senses. I'm praying. The Bible says to pray that God will bring us to our senses and that we will escape the snare of the devil. Snare means a trap he set for us. The devil's setting traps right now. He sets traps. What trap? We, if we set a trap for another, we'll fall in our own trap. The Bible says when the enemy sets a trap for you, God sees it, and he'll cause the enemy to fall in his own trap. Let me tell you what, when you fight against God's disciples, you fight against God. And how many knows you never win if you fight against God? God is always victorious. It's not wise to fight against God. It takes a foolish person to fight against God, right? Who would stand in God's face and fight? But let me tell you what. On the last day, Satan himself will still fight God. He will be in the earth. He will be on the earth. And when the Lord splits that eastern sky and comes down and he's on the white horses and we're with him, the Bible says the enemy will still be trying to fight God with human weapons. And God will release one tiny angel and put him in the abyss. Mm -mm -mm. Let me tell you what. You stand with God. You don't worry about what other people do. You just stand for God. You just have to get to, to the place where you say, as for me, I've made up my mind. I'm going on with Jesus. I've probably told you this story before. I was raised by a grandmother that she prayed a lot. That woman prayed a lot. She carried handkerchiefs always, and they were always soaked with tears and snot because she regularly found places on her knees and when she prayed it was not quiet she travailed and labored over us 
She was praying over me when I didn't even understand what the woman was doing. I was young. I just wanted some grits and eggs and put a cake in the oven and hurry, Granny, and let's eat. And she would fix us breakfast. And she'd say, I'll be back in a minute. Y'all sit at the table and eat. And she would go down a hall and go into a bedroom. And she would get her handkerchief. And she would get on her knees. And we heard her for sometimes 30, 40, 40 minutes crying out to God for her sons, for her daughters, and for her grandchildren. That's what we need to be doing again today. We need to get down on our knees and we need to cry out to God to save our families. She would call them out by name. I can hear her calling them now. I can still hear her, and she's been dead many years. I can still hear her, and I was a little girl. I can hear her calling her children's names. Do you know it's powerful when you call your children's name to God? Daddies and mothers, it's powerful when you call your children's names. She would call us by name. But my grandmother always finished with this. She would say, Lord, whether anybody goes with me or not, I'm going on with you. And I pray they all come. But I'm not turning back. That's the kind of made-up mind that you have to have when you serve the Lord. I am not turning back. That's that true love and devotion for God that he demands. Your allegiance has to be to him above everyone, including spouse, including parents, including your brothers and sisters, including your kinsfolks, and including your friends. You got to love God more than them all. You got to put God first more than them all. You got to put him above and prefer him above and do what he wants you to do above everybody else and what they want you to do. You have to put him first. He will not take second place. I, I say this, you will most likely be tried in this very thing. And you may not understand what's going on unless you understand Jesus' words. This helps us to be able to see the light and understand what may be going on. Amen? That may be just what's going on. Amen? I want to close this morning with a prayer that Paul exhorted the church and he prayed over us. He prayed over the church at Thessalonica. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And the Lord turned, after I studied this, the Lord just turned me to this particular prayer. And I felt that the Lord said, I want you to pray this prayer to me for the body of Christ. And I said, okay, Lord, show me what you want me to pray. And it begins in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. And I pray this over you right now in Jesus' name. I pray for you that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who has called you and also, he will do it. Come on, say, he will do it. Say, he will keep me spotless and blameless. Amen. And I pray that for us all. I, I want you to help me this week. It's after Paul prayed this for the church, he said, brethren, pray for us. I want your prayers. I covet your prayers. I need your prayers. Brethren, pray for us. Because the, the, the disciples was in a struggle. 
It was not always easy. It's not always easy living for the Lord. But it's necessary that we take a stand now. And we continue in patience to possess our souls. Amen. So I just want to close with that prayer this morning. And I want you to bow your heads with me if you would. And let's just pray. Lord, we thank you that you are, you have overcome the world. You said in your word, these things have I spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but in me you have peace. You said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So, Lord, we're of good cheer this morning. We are encouraged by your words. It's your word that gives us strength. It's your word that gives us light. Your words are an entrance of light that expels darkness and hopelessness and despair. And, Father, I pray this morning that this word has went into our hearts and it has brought hope where there was despair, that it's brought strength where there was weakness. That it's brought encouragement where there was discouragement and helplessness. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will strengthen each and every one of us. And do what this prayer says. Sanctify us wholly. And may you take our whole body, our whole spirit, and our whole soul. And may you preserve us blameless unto the coming of the Lord. This I pray. For your body, for everyone under the sound of my voice, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you were blessed by today's message. For more messages, to contact us, send your prayer request, or to make donations to support this outreach ministry, go to lighthouseoutreach.org or download our app on iTunes, Google, or any Android device. If you're ever in our area, we invite you to visit us at 9437 West U.S. Highway 84, about seven miles west of Ross Clark Circle in Dothan, Alabama.